So I had a lot of people telling me I was wrong to trust manufacturer recommended maintenance intervals instead of using the traditional 3000 mile interval. Today I'm going to cover how oil filters and additives are better than they were 30 years ago, what manufacturers do to test engines before they're released, what actually causes engine issues, why using the manufacturer recommended parts is important, and why don't you just change the oil more often as insurance. So how has oil improved in the last 30 years? Oil refining is better than it was 30 years ago. For instance, we have five groups of base oil, group 1 to 5. And most engine oils are base 2, 3, or 4. This base oil determines whether or not the oil can be called conventional or synthetic. Group 4 oils are synthesized in a lab and are the only true synthetic oils. But oils with a group 3 base can also be considered synthetic oils as well. I can go much deeper into oil formulation processes in a separate video and how some of what I said isn't completely true, but the basic takeaway is that engine oils today are using a higher base oil, such as base 3 or base 4 oils, than they were 30 years ago when they used base 2 or sometimes even base 1 oils. And the difference in the chemical properties between these base oils is pretty dramatic. But there's more to oil improvement than just the base oils. The base oils give a good start, but today, the additive packs in the oil are just as, if not more, complex than the base oil itself. We have everything from anti-wear additives and friction modifiers that protect the engine and make the oil more slippery, to tackifiers that allow the oil to cling to metal parts in the engine, to cleaners that remove carbon deposits from the engine. These additives take the already vastly improved base oil and give it properties that allow it to both last longer and resist breaking down in the heat of the engine. And speaking of longevity, Engines typically hold much more oil than they used to, so the oil isn't cycled as much as it was previously. If we look at a 1990 Mustang GT with a 5 liter engine, it held 5 quarts, as opposed to the same displacement 5 liter engine in a 2020 Mustang GT with 10 quarts, or double the capacity. But that's just how the oiling process has improved. How have oil filters improved? There's three qualities in a filter that need to be addressed. Filtration efficiency, flow rate, and storage capacity. Filtration efficiency refers to how small of particles can be filtered out of the oil. Flow rate refers to how fast the oil can flow. And storage capacity refers to how much of the particulates in the oil can be stored in the oil filter before it needs to be replaced. And all these parameters are sort of fighting against each other. If you have a filter medium with a high flow rate, the filtration efficiency will drop. If you have a bunch of particulates stored in the oil filter, the flow rate will drop. So some outside the box solutions have been made, like adding more of these paper pleats, which allows more oil to pass through much more efficiently. These improvements mean we can have extended oil change intervals compared to 30 years ago. So what goes into a manufacturer's testing of an engine before it gets to the consumer? Once the first prototype of the engine is made, it starts to go through durability testing. The first testing focuses mostly on hardware to make sure the engine has the right mechanical pieces in it, and that the engine has the ability to meet the targets that the manufacturer has. This is also where the initial oil change algorithm is created. Once this engine has been tested on the engine dyno and any major hardware revisions are completed, the software teams start to further refine the engine controls. Generally, manufacturers have somewhere between one and five engines running continuously 24 seven, and they use these engines to test for two things, emissions and durability. Oil changes are performed on these engines, and the oil is analyzed down to the microscopic level to investigate how both the oil and the engine held up before the oil change. The service interval algorithm can be changed based on the results of this test. All the while, these engines are being continuously run for a year at varying RPM, varying load, and anything that could mimic a real-life scenario. Once the engines have made it past the first stage, the first prototypes of the vehicle are created. One of the first things done with these vehicles is that they're sent to a high mileage accumulation company. Somewhere between 3 and 7 vehicles are sent to be driven for 16 to 20 hours a day, 5 to 7 days a week, to put as many miles as possible on these vehicles. See, a manufacturer doesn't want a vehicle that's going to have an issue affecting 25% of vehicles at 60,000 miles. But if we only run 3 vehicles, how do we know that we just didn't happen to get the vehicles that make up the other 75%? That's the reason that these vehicles have somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300,000 miles put on them. And the oil changes are not performed by the manufacturer, they're performed by the high mileage company, adding more variables to simulate how the engine is going to be treated in real life. And this oil is again tested after every oil change, because if there's any minor issue, the manufacturer wants to know. 
That takes us to the next level of prototype. These are generally much closer to the actual production vehicle. These could potentially include some hardware revisions, and the same procedure for mileage accumulation is followed on these vehicles, 16 to 20 hours a day, and generally to the same 250 to 300,000 miles. By the time an engine makes it to the public, it generally has somewhere between 120 to 300,000 hours and millions of miles spread across anywhere between 8 to 20 engines. Most importantly to this conversation, this testing takes place using the manufacturer recommended parts and intervals. I could just give the simple answer, which is that engines are impossibly complex with thousands of mechanical parts, and to get everything right mechanically in software and in manufacturing is a near impossible task, but there's more to it than that. Sometimes the manufacturers won't test every situation or simply get the manufacturing wrong. We can look at Ford and their intake valve issues, Toyota and their debris in the V6 engines, or BMW and their aluminum camshaft adjustment screws. All of these weren't accounted for, and all of those are mistakes from engineers. Sometimes this is avoidable. For example, BMW using aluminum camshaft screws should have been a pretty obvious blunder, but my guess is that the engineer in charge, also known as the Design Release Engineer, or DRE, heard from their supplier that the aluminum was fine and actually had some benefits, didn't investigate it thoroughly enough, and BMW had to release a recall. Funny enough, Porsche had the exact same issue at around the same time. What are the odds that these two German companies used two different suppliers that both made the same mistake? Anyway, that's not the main point. Mistakes do happen, and unfortunately, when they happen in the context of a production engine, they can affect thousands or millions of people. Well, you're right, longevity is not always the end goal. Sometimes cheap cars are made to be cheap. Some are designed to be fun. Some are designed to look nice. But at the end of the day, the end goal of any manufacturer is to be profitable. That's mostly achieved by selling cars and parts. If you want to sell cars and parts, you want to give owners a good experience with their vehicle. If you have engines that are grenading 20 miles past the warranty, you're probably not going to sell another car to those people. And there's a common rule of thumb that obtaining a new customer is five times more expensive than retaining a current customer. So manufacturers don't want to risk losing a customer. There's a lot more that goes into it, but the idea is that a manufacturer has a reputation to maintain. That the manufacturer put hundreds of thousands of miles on every engine. And while we don't have access to the data from the oil analyses on these, manufacturers are not going to risk thousands of engine replacements or being investigated by NHTSA because they ignored some negative oil analysis results. So if following recommended oil change intervals won't cause your engine to blow up, even if they're longer than 3,000 miles, what causes engines to blow up? In the context of oil-related issues, the answer is sludge. This is sludge. It's a nasty, grimy buildup of all the dirt and oxidized bits in an engine. It comes from a number of places, but primarily oxidation of your engine oil. Oxidation is just a fancy word for saying that the oil breaks down, and the hotter the oil gets, the more susceptible it is to this oxidation reaction. Remember the five groups of oils that we talked about before? As you go up the groups, the oil becomes more thermally stable, which helps prevent this oxidation from taking place. But that doesn't fully prevent sludge buildup. So going back to how much better modern oil is, modern oil contains additives that adhere to these byproducts of this oxidation, and once adhered, the resulting molecule is large enough to be filtered out by the oil filter. So you have these oil filters here, and this is a genuine OEM BMW filter. And this is an aftermarket filter. You can see that there's a bit of a difference, but that's not the important part. The important part is the filter material itself. If we completely take these apart, we can see the OEM filter has a thicker filter material, which provides better filtration. And we can see that the OEM filter has a larger surface area, which provides better oil flow necessary because the filter material is thicker. So just use the manufacturer's recommended filter. Now let's look at the oil. Oil is oil, but the additive packages can be very different. For example, high mileage oil has additives that soften the gaskets in an engine. Some oils have more tactifiers, some have different amounts of anti-wear additives, and there's pros and cons of each. I won't get too in-depth, but as an example, ZDDP used to be very common in oil, as it's an anti-wear metal that helps prevent wear when the oil film gets lower than a certain thickness. However, when this additive ends up in the combustion chamber, it reaches the catalytic converter and reacts with the converter, 
and shortens the life of the catalytic converter dramatically. All of these reactions have been thought of by engineers, and the oil was designed with specifics like this in mind. So use the oil that your manufacturer recommends. Well, if you don't do them yourself, doing them two or three times as often as necessary, add $150 to $300 per oil change, adds up quick. In 10 years, that could be $3,000. Here's an abstract for an investigation performed by the SAE where they found that extended drain intervals had a benefit. The study ran three vehicles in Las Vegas and oil samples were collected at various intervals between 3,000 and 15,000 miles. They found that the composition of the additive film clinging to the metal in the engine at 3,000 mile intervals and 12,000 mile intervals were similar. They also found that vehicles with a 12,000 mile interval had 10 to 15% lower friction and 10 times lower wear rate than fresh oils. If that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, the general idea is that at 12,000 miles, modern oil was performing better, not just the same, but actually better, in terms of engine protection than fresh oil. Now it does acknowledge that there are other factors in extending oil change intervals, but I think it's pretty clear. There is no benefit to changing your oil more often than the manufacturer recommends. I'm not saying to let your oil go for 10,000 miles in a car that doesn't recommend that. But I am saying to follow the manufacturer recommended interval.